Thank you so much. Everyone's been so cooperative with uh, allowing the proceedings to move so smoothly so far. Uh, for this panel, um, Greg Stone from the Munger Tolls Firm is going to be moderating a panel of our uh, home judges, district court judges here. Uh, Greg is uh, actually, uh, by virtue of random <coughs> assignment and everything else, has had a, a lot of cases uh, and a lot of uh, arguments and trials and everything else in front of Judge White. So we thought it was only fitting to have him moderate one of the panels. Greg, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, it is thrilling, in fact, to be here, and I'm, I really feel privileged and honored to join all of you in honoring Judge White. Um, my role today is a simple one, which is to let all of you hear some very wise, interesting, and perhaps somewhat humorous observations from three current judges in the Northern District. But before I perform the role of moderator, I would like to take just a moment of personal privilege and say a few comments about the experiences that I had. I have had several, I think probably a tr truer statement would be many weeks in trial in front of Judge White. Um, there's many here in the room who have had similar experiences, some at the same time I was there, some on the same side of the courtroom I was on and some on the other side. Uh, but I think all of us, and I think I speak for all of the lawyers who have tried cases in Judge White's courtroom, uh, it was really a delight. There were moments when it wasn't feeling so much fun at the moment, but in hindsight, I think we all looked back at it as a delight. And what I would say on behalf of all of those lawyers who've had that great opportunity is that Judge White is a judge who epitomizes what a trial judge should be. I was going to say that he is a trial lawyer's judge, but that would be incomplete at best because it was not the case being tried for the benefit of the lawyers, although he treated all of the lawyers with complete courtesy and respect. It was that the case was being tried for the justice that he wanted to be sure was delivered to the parties. And it was that commitment that we all knew from the moment we entered his courtroom. And we also learned very quickly how to behave because he was calm when around him were a bunch of people who were not so interested in being calm and who sometimes weren't as calm as maybe they should be. But we learned that that was how we should conduct ourselves. And he led by that example and ultimately, and it didn't take long, we came to learn that he was fair as you could be and wiser by far than anybody had a right to be. Uh, and all of that came through. And I was there during the times, I think Judge Ware said everybody was worried because in the middle of the Rambus trial, he decided that he should go to senior status. And some of us who are here today uh, see a soon-to-be magistrate judge who was there at the same time. Um, we, we don't think we were responsible for him going to senior <laughs> status. <laughs> so I just wanted to get that in in defense. Um, so with that, uh, it's very much my honor and privilege to introduce the th panel of three current Northern District judges, each of whom has their own ties to Judge White. Judge Ilston, who went on the bench in the Northern District within months, I believe, of Judge White. A couple of years. A couple of years? Oh, okay. Close. Judge Coe, who took the seat that Judge White uh, vacated when he went senior. Um, and Judge Seaborg, who spent, I think, nine years in the courthouse before he became then a district judge. He was then a magistrate, and so has been on the bench in very close proximity to Judge White for quite some time. So I'm gonna allow each of them to have the same moment of personal privilege that I had and share with you, starting with Judge Ilston, some recollections, observations about Judge White. Thank you, Greg. And I feel absolutely honored to be able to share this time with all of you. Um, it's been a privilege to share the bench with Judge White and I'm really happy to be here today to, uh, to talk about it. Um, Judge Walker mentioned having a 
claim construction hearing where there were two Nobel Prize winners in the courtroom taking opposite sides, which makes you think about the Nobel Prize. And I've been thinking about <laughs> I've been thinking about the Nobel Prize for Literature, which just a couple of weeks ago was given to Bob Dylan. <clears throat> so for those of us of a certain age, that's a very meaningful thing that just happened. Which brings me to something that Judge White left out when he told you about his background. Judge Graywell was asking him um, you know, careful questions, and he was giving careful responses. What he didn't tell you uh, in response to those questions was that when he was in high school, he was in high school with Frank Zappa. So there's a connection that Ron has that we didn't even know about. Um, I, feel, I feel a kinship with Ron for um, a couple of reasons. Um, while he was practicing in uh, San Jose, uh, I was practicing in San Mateo County. So we were both sort of practicing in, down the peninsula. We both did civil work um, and mainly trial work. We were most often on different sides of, of the case uh, from one another, but we were traveling in the same community. And I can tell you that um, the reputation that Ron had at that time was that he was one of the good ones. He was the kind of guy whose word you would take if he gave it to you, and whose hand you would shake and you would rely on it if he shook your hand. So he's been just an, a, a real role model in the community um, for all those years, prior to, prior to the Superior Court bench and prior to the Federal Court bench. Um, so we had that in common. We also had in common that um, each of us was a math major and each, each of us learned during the course of that that we didn't have a future in mathematics and therefore went to law school. So I have long felt the kinship with Ron for that reason as well. Um, but uh, in, in, in describing the kind of civil practice that Ron had prior to taking the bench, and then, and of course he was years on the, on the superior court, state court, and then on federal court, um, I know, and, and he told you, that he didn't do any kind of patent work as a lawyer, um, and neither did I. So we, we had that in common as well. Um, and now, of course, he's, the, he's really the mentor to most of the judges in this country on what, what patent cases should look like, um, which is a remarkable thing. And that brings me to my next, my next point. I want to tell you a story, um, and this story is not about Judge White. And you'll see at the end of the story what I mean by that. So the story is this, um, and, and some of you may know this already. Um, lawyers are people who know a little bit about a lot of different things, and they keep learning less and less about more and more until finally they know nothing about everything. <laughs> Experts, by contrast, are people who know a whole lot about a few things, and they keep learning more and more about less and less until finally they know everything about nothing. <laughs> Judges are people who start out knowing everything about everything and wind up knowing nothing about anything on account of their close association with lawyers and experts. <laughs> and that is not Ron White. He's, he's the, the unusual one who has been learning every step of the way. He came into a job for which he didn't have personal experience. He learned about it. He continued to learn about it. And then he taught all the rest of us about it. And I just think he's completely remarkable in that way. And we are just so grateful to have had the experience of working with him. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you so much, Judge Elston. Judge Coe, would you like to share some observations about the seat you filled when he went senior? So Judge White has actually been my mentor for the last six and a half years, and I go to him all the time. Um, fortunately, in addition to getting the benefit of the patent local rules and the jury instructions, I'm just a few doors down. So I just immediately go down the hall uh, often, and I will even call him at home if I can't find him, and 
poor Anne has received any of those calls. Um, I'm just really grateful that he's never sought a restraining order against me over the last <laughs> six and a half years, despite all the times that I've contacted him, he has always been so patient and so polite and so kind. I mean, he's very busy. I never understood it when I came. I knew he was senior status, but he was there every weekend. He was there late at night. I was very puzzled. I thought, why do people go senior status when you have to work so hard? <laughs> he was just so diligent. Um, and so my only consolation, I've really been struggling with this when I it's hard for me to imagine him not being in the courthouse, but I think I'm still going to be calling you. So you can run, but you cannot hide. <laughs> I have all of your numbers, and uh, you, know, you can talk to Judge Jensen. He thought retirement would get rid of me as well, but I still call him up for advice occasionally um, and uh, to join us down in the courthouse for lunch. So thank you, Judge White. And Judge Seaborg. Um, your observations from well, many perspectives, I think. Well, thank you, uh, Greg, and you're right. I did serve for uh, about eight years as a magistrate judge in, in San Jose, uh, down the hall from Ron. But actually, my uh, story with Ron White goes way back before that. Um, 24 years ago, I was a uh, newly minted assistant United States attorney, uh, about a year into it. And I felt I really pretty much knew the lay of the land, and we had a small a world, small courthouse, as Jim Weir mentioned, and I was told that this new federal district judge had arrived. And so uh, I had my first appearance in front of Ron. And I went over and I was going to demonstrate to him that I was really the king of the castle and knew the lay of the land, and a uh, case was called, and Ron took the bench, and I remember as if it were yesterday, he started out by saying uh, to myself and the defense lawyer, um, I'm new at this. I don't really know uh, much about federal criminal law. So I'm going to look to you to give me some advice and guidance and anything that you can tell me, I will greatly appreciate. And I looked over to the defense lawyer and we went, where did this guy come from? <laughs> and I remember uh, the comment that my uh, colleague, criminal defense lawyer made, um, she said, it appears he has skipped the federal judgeitis class. <laughs> uh, and that is, of course, true. And it's true through to this day. Ron is unpretentious, incredibly hardworking, wants to figure out the answer, to shamelessly pander to the Stanford folks. He's the Christian McCaffrey of our court. <laughs> he puts his head down. He runs forward. He gets it done. Um, uh, no showboating, not flashy not the one ever to demonstrate he's the smartest guy in the room, even though he is. Um, and so he has been just an extraordinary inspiration, I think, to all of us who have had the great privilege to work with him. I, I'm going to take a page out of my former chief's book, uh, and I bet he doesn't even remember this. And it starts from a, an incident that uh, was alarming. Uh, Ron was distracted one day, because he's always thinking about his work in cases, and he walked into the light rail. Uh, and we were all very, very concerned. And he went off to the hospital, and they took care of him. And not surprisingly, he was back in the office, working away. And our chief judge sent out a message that said, does anyone have a report on how the train is doing? <laughs> uh, and it, it just encapsulates Ron White. I mean, he was indestructible incredibly hardworking, uh, and, and just got the job done. And frankly, I don't know how well the train uh, did. I, I didn't follow up on that. But uh, just to, to bring those comments to a close, uh, Ron has been a, a mentor, a, a supporter of mine throughout my whole career, and most importantly, a, a really dear friend. And um, the only salvation in my mind is that I know I'm going to stay in touch with him. We go every year to the Bank of the West Tennis Tournament, and I'm going to continue that tradition as long as I can. So thank you for letting me be a part of this. Thanks, Judge Seaborg. Um, let me ask you a little bit about what's happened uh, to the patent docket in the Northern District since the time that 1992, when Judge White was appointed to the bench. And according to the figures I looked at, and 
nobody should trust my numbers because I was the one in 2,000 person that got scolded for that as not being able to do the math. So don't trust my numbers at all. But um, there were 83 patent cases filed that year. And I think because of the way the, the inter-district rules worked at that time, a very large number of those ended up in San Jose. Last year, there were 221, nearly a threefold increase. Uh, but I think the impact has been much greater even than that increase in percentages. Uh, and I wondered if each of you would comment on the trends you've seen in the patent docket uh, on its way up, on its way down, uh, the different things you've seen over the course of your careers. And maybe Judge Coe, I could ask you to start it off with sort of an overview on that. Well, I only have um, since 2010 to, uh, to speak of. But when I started, I would say virtually all of my patent cases were competitor cases. They all went basically uh, to the very end, either trial or they settled right before jury selection. Um, and I've seen just an increase during the time I've been on the court. It's not that long. Uh, just a higher percentage of my patent cases are serial filed cases that usually settle sometime around the initial case management conference. Now that's not to say that there still aren't competitor cases, it's just become a much less percentage of my own docket. Um, I, I think there's, it feels like less is going on because of Alice, because of IPRs, um, and I would just say that I have some statistics here from the Federal Judicial Center. They've done a five-year sort of anniversary report on the patent pilot program, and at least for the Northern District, uh, in the cases that were filed from when we joined the pilot, which was January 1 of 2012 through January 15 of 2016, 33% of our patent cases now are, are serially filed cases. And that's actually gone down a couple of percentages. Um, the numbers from January 2012 through August of 2014 were about 35%. So to me, it feels like it's a higher percentage, but I, I think you know, my colleagues who've been on the court much longer can say whether that's just, you know, my own personal experience that's just anecdotal or whether it's statistically significant. What do you think, Judge Ilson? What's been your experience over your time on the bench? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know the answer to Lucy's question, so I'll just <laughs> answer a different one. Um, <laughs> I can say that when I, when I came on the bench, um, I, I think we were right at the tag end of the, of the, of the, uh, situation where the patent cases mostly were in San Jose and we, we it was right around the time I came on that we, we made it district-wide venue. So when I started, uh, there, there weren't quite, uh, and I'm in San Francisco, there weren't quite the number on my docket that there would have been on Ron's and on Jim Ware's and, and on the other folks in San Jose. But that, that changed um, pretty quick as we, as we switched up the, uh, the venue. But the, the thing that has made the most difference between then and now to me is that they were mostly competitor cases back then. And that was before we had the local rules. And someone had talked about uh, 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 the disposition of patent lawyers and how there's at least a rumor about that they can be um, prickly, they can be argumentative, they can be feisty, they can be downright nasty sometimes. Early on, I think that was more true than it is today, and I think that was because of the, of the uncertainty. Everybody needed an edge. Nobody knew where these cases were going. Most of us on the bench, Ron accepted, still didn't know the first thing about patent cases, and, and anxiety made everybody really, really nervous and, and, and frequently unpleasant. I think having the rules, which gives us a default, so nobody has to fight over, over where you start on, on things like who has to put in his contentions first and that sort of thing has enormously reduced the tension, at least the observable tension to us. So my experience has been that the, the litigation and trial of patent cases from the time I started until now has become much better. Uh, it's become far less fraught on the front end with the lawyers and it's become um, uh, much smoother, I think, uh, on the trial end of things. Um, I do think we have a lot, we, it feels like we have a lot fewer 
this year than maybe we did two years ago or three years ago. Um, but um, there's, there's still plenty of, of work to be done, but I, I think having the, um, the standards that we have, the rules, the, the model protective orders, and the other things that people can, can point to and, and not, not feel they're being one-upped by anybody else in the case uh, have really reduced the tension level of the cases that we try. Judge Seaborn, um, after hearing my good friend, uh, Chief Judge Stark, say the number of cases he has, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm embarrassed how small uh, numbers are. But I can tell you that I did take sort of a snapshot of, of my current docket, and it's about 50-50 competitor, non-practicing entity cases. Uh, about a third of my patent cases are currently stayed uh, for IPR. And in the last two years, I've issued five uh, 101 orders. So that gives you sort of a current flavor. I think back when I, I did start as a magistrate judge, I would seek patent cases primarily in discovery and then as a settlement judge. And I do think there has been um, certainly a change over time in terms of the, the variety of uh, types of cases that have the patent label on them coming through. Um, and I actually think there's been a very positive change with the bar. When I, when I think back in, in earlier days, I think the ability of, of patent lawyers, and maybe it was a function of, of uh, the perception of whether or not litigators wanted to take on patent cases, the presentation was harder for judges, I think, without a scientific background. And the bar has gotten the message, I think, that they need to present to both judges and juries in a way that uh, the judicial officer can understand it. And I think the quality has gotten much, much better. Um, now, uh, and I know I haven't gotten any smarter, so it really must be in the presentational ability of counsel to realize that they can't stay in the weeds when they're presenting uh, very technical and complicated materials. They've got to do it in a way that a hopefully intelligent person without that background can grasp. And I think there's been great improvement from thinking back on when I started. Let me ask just a little more about the patent local rules, since I think that's been a topic we've heard about earlier today. And, and I, I agree, Judge Ilston, very much with your point that it created a sense of predictability so lawyers knew what they were likely to see in terms of a schedule and, a, and so on. But how often do each of you deviate for one reason or another from the schedule set out in the patent local rules, and what sort of leads you to do that? Do you want to start, Judge Seaborn? Sure. I, I sort of view them as I do Ninth Circuit pattern jury instructions. Uh, unless you can give me a good argument uh, as to why uh, I should deviate, I'm not going to do it, because I think it gives us, for all the reasons we've discussed, a great structure and jumping off point. But I have deviated from the rules from time to time um, if the parties can articulate a, a really good reason why there is something unusual. But I have to say, for me, the default is to go by the rules because I, I've heard from time to time that the rules can be too complicated if it's a s relatively small patent case, but I haven't seen a relatively small patent case for a <laughs> long time. So I, I actually think they're, they're, uh, they are the default for me. Uh, I have varied, but I, I can't say I do it very often. Judge Koh, can we ask you the same question? Sure. I also rarely deviate from the patent local rules, and if I do, it's more that we've adopted the rules and then something unusual and unexpected has happened in the middle of a case that requires some deviation. But as an initial matter, that's sort of the default. I've had people say, well, this is a different kind of case. It's a smaller case. The issues on claim construction aren't going to be as complicated. Uh, so could we shorten up some of the time frames? Because th that's the, the main issues that's been presented to me anyway, is that it takes a long time to get to the points where we need to go. And I've, I, can, I can remember, I've probably done it more than once, but I can remember one time uh, when I did that, I had a case once. This, this is the simple case, Richard. I had a case once involving a patent on a, um, a sun visor that had a wig on it to keep the sun off your head if you were bald on the golf course. <laughs> and believe it or not, they got a patent on that, and, and somebody else had another sun visor, 
but the wig had like curly hair <laughs> instead of straight hair. So that one, I figured we could probably shorten up the time frame a little on the uh, local rules. So let me ask, let me broaden this out a bit and talk about one of my experiences with Judge White was some of the, what I found innovative steps he had us take to try to make the case more easily understood by the jury. So we did several things. The one that I found most interesting was we took pictures of every witness before they went on the witness stand and then included those photos in the jury notebook that the jurors kept so that they would be able to associate the witness with their picture as well as with whatever notes they took referring to the witness's name uh, as well. So that was one of many things that I think we did to try in, to make the case more readily understood and followed by the jury. And I wondered if each of you would share some observations of techniques you have that you think lawyers would benefit from in terms of trying to make a complicated case a bit more understandable to the jury um, in trial. So, Judge well, Ilston, or Judge well, Seaborg, I, just say, I think that, I don't know, Ron may confirm this. I got that uh, use of the, of the pictures of the witness from Sue, so I don't there know. There you go. That's probably where he got it as well. I actually think that's a really good thing, but, but remember to tell your witnesses that they're going to have their picture taken because they can look, you don't want them to look like uh, <laughs> it's a, a mugshot. But I, we do give them to the jury, and, and the jury really likes it. I mean, I, they've commented to me afterwards that it, it's such a good uh, memory jogger for them to have the picture uh, of the witness. You know, I don't, this won't exactly answer your question, but we'll go off on one of my pet peeves, but I'll do it very quickly. Um, I, I am very appreciative of, of the technology that we can now use in the courtroom and the the very, uh, um, s uh, you know, s bells and whistles presentation that we sometimes get. Um, but I do think that can be overdone. And I think people should always have a plan B. Uh, it's not so much in jury presentation, but in any argument to the judge, uh, if the judge wants to deviate from your uh, PowerPoint presentation, be prepared to go with the judge. Because I think somewhat with the newer lawyers in particular, they get so wedded to the technology that they want to show me that when I ask a question that isn't in the order that the technology is going to take them, they get a bit frazzled. And so I, I think the technology is fine. I think it's better used uh, for claim construction, big issues. It, you don't need the, all of the this, you know, fireworks for a, uh, a, a first to file motion or something like that. I think you kind of uh, need to pick your battles when you use it and always have a plan B if you can't go through your, your, your fancy presentation in the way you'd like to go through it. Judge Ilston, I, I gave credit, I guess, where I, I well, it should have been credit to you on the photos. In the oh, photos well, but no, well, we, we've, all, we've all been doing that, and I do think it helps. But it, for those of you in the room who are patent lawyers, what you need to think about is this. If the jurors are telling us afterwards, boy, that really helps me just to see the face and remember the person, that's the level at which we're operating in these cases. You know, you're talking about nuclear physics, and we're talking about trying to remember who the witness was who said the various things that were said. So it, it, it makes you realize who your audience is. We are, we are humans, and we are not trained in the same way that most of you are as lawyers. Um, uh, you, your question had to do with, I think, with trials as much mm -hmm. as anything else, and certainly the, you know, the idea of having, having uh, photos is good, uh, trial notebooks uh, um, sometimes can work, I think. Sometimes they can be, they can be a little complicated. Um, questions from jurors are one of the issues that we, that we float, and I think some, some judges will tell jurors that you may ask questions, and if so, you know, put them on a piece of paper and hand them up. And I think some judges have found that that's very effective. Um, I, I don't do that. I don't want to solicit questions to the point where there becomes a competition among the jury to ask questions, because that's not useful either. Uh, but if we get a written question, if a juror says they have a question, then we'll take the written questions, give them to the lawyers, and, and let the lawyers respond as appropriate. 
sometimes, of course, a question may be on an area that's, that's inadmissible and, and can't be answered, but if it can be, it lets, the, it lets the lawyers know where the jurors are confused and can be useful. Um, and the last thing I'd note is that I think if you can, if you can get really good graphics in your case, you're, you're miles ahead. It's so much easier to understand things if there are clear, good graphics. So I think it's worth investing a lot of thought in how can you explain whether it's a damage theory, whether it's an infringement theory, whether it's just to explain how the uh, accused device works. But a, a seer, clear, simple graphic can be, uh, can be very, very helpful. Judge Coe, what are your thoughts on So I, I learned the jury notebook with witness photos from Chief Judge Hamilton, so everyone has been <laughs> teaching everyone. Um, you know, I would say on the witness photos, I had one case where the expert submitted a photo of himself that was about 20 years old. And so he had a full head of hair, he was much younger, and then when he came on the stand, no one recognized him, because he at that point was completely bald, 20 years older. So now I require that you take the photo before the witness goes on the witness stand. So if they had a ketchup stain on the shirt, that should be in the photo so people can remember exactly what they look like when they testified. Um, I think what's been the most helpful for me is just um, imposing case narrowing limits because otherwise it's just been overwhelming um, and that has really helped focus hopefully the parties on their best case and their best defenses and then also allowed us to be able to focus our limited resources on what the most important issues are and also make it more understandable for the jury instead of having so much going to them and having to be decided all at once. So when you talk about limits on a case, mm -hmm. which I guess can be done with time limits, it can be done with number of claims, and in various ways. How do you decide what's the best way for the case, and then how do you decide what the right limit is? So not every case will need them. Sometimes it's a one patent case and there are just a few claims, so it, it's really a case-by-case -case, uh, specific determination, and it's also negotiation and discussion with the parties as to what they think they need, but if you, you know, you have a case of 18 patents, we can't handle that, and neither can the jury, and it would be better also for the parties to be more focused. So it's a conversation, um, and it can be one that gets decided at the outset, or one that sort of gets negotiated as the case moves along. What about you, Judge Elston? Do you, what do you do to sort of keep the limits on the case and the trial? Um, a couple of things. For starters, and this again is a default in much the way that the local rules are a default, I'll tell people you can't, I'm not going to construe any more than uh, 10 terms. That's negotiable, but that's, it's a start. And it gets people thinking in the right, right sort of uh, uh, framework about how much claim construction we're going to do. Of course, if there's more than that that needs to be done, we can do it, but at a later time. But as an initial go, then I tell them that. Um, as Lucy says, with respect to the number of patents or the number of claims, if, if the case is so big that it can't be tried all at once, that's a negotiation. And um, my, in my experience, we've never got to step two. So if we've, if we've tried some but not all, the cases haven't come back, which isn't to say they, they may not. I mean, of course they might, but at some point... Um, uh, the reality of things kicks in, and people people kind of kind of bring that to a conclusion. But um, and then finally, I I do uh, impose time limits on uh, on all civil cases, including patent cases. I think it it make it helps the lawyers really focus more clearly on what they need to put in. It gives it gives lawyers a little bit of leverage against clients because clients sometimes want to put in every bit of the ki kitchen sink, and the lawyer can blame the judge, say, "I don't have time to do that. We need to." We need to pare it down. The single, single greatest complaint we hear from jurors is, why did they ask that question 10 times? I got it the first time. Didn't they think that they think I was a, a dummy? So it, it really makes you try your case better, I think, to have the time limits. So I, I do that in, um, in every instance. And may I just give a little shout out to <clears throat> Texas, which somebody mentioned earlier in the day. Almost all lawyers, when you ask them how long is this case going to take, pretty much they'll say two weeks now. And, and I credit the Eastern District of Texas with that. I think they've been training them up back there that you can do this in two weeks. And so people are pretty content with that as an estimate. Um, 
uh, in most cases these days. Judge Seaborg, what kinds of things do you do? To well, I, I certainly agree on the uh, our local rule that says um, the you've got to prioritize your ten uh, terms for construction and. Uh, I invoke that, as I think my colleagues do, and I haven't, uh, it's negotiable, I suppose, but it, it has, I haven't had the experience where we've actually had to go beyond that. Where there are uh, numerous patents in the case, I actually, and so there's a question about uh, how many claims can go forward and, and then there are how many prior art references can you make. I try to, at least for a couple of rounds, send it back to the parties using the bully pulpit saying, you've got, to, you've got to talk about limiting this further. Give me a new proposal and come back in two weeks. And, and generally, I find that they, 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 they sort of come back after thinking about it with something that's manageable. One limit I, am, uh, I have learned, the school of hard knocks I, I learned, which was the number of summary judgment motions. I had no limit when I started as a district judge. And I think I had one case where I had something like, eight or nine, and they were, they were going to continue uh, along this. So, well, this didn't work. Let's try this one. And I said, no, enough. No seriatim summary judgment motion. So I, I limit the parties to one uh, unless, again, they can demonstrate to me that there is a reason why if you have more than one summary judgment motion, there is a, we can deal with a discrete issue that actually may streamline the case. But unless you can give me a good reason for that, I, I confine the parties to one. And like all my colleagues, I think I do put time limits on, and I, uh, I would be surprised if there would ever be a case, civil case, where I wouldn't do that. Let me ask you, Judge Seaborg, and you, Judge Coe, to follow up on one of the questions I asked Judge Ilson, which is, do you let jurors ask questions of either witnesses or the parties in some fashion? No. <laughs> I think some of that is, I think, quite frankly, I think it may be the, the experiences we have uh, coming to the bench. I, because I was a prosecutor for a healthy number of years, I, I think I'm a little more leery of, of uh, losing control over what questions get asked. Obviously, in a criminal case, you could have a question that could really louse the system up uh, be, because they could ask something that could be very prejudicial and problematic. So I don't, uh, I'm not uh, of the view that we should encourage questions, and I realize that may mean I'm out of the, uh, the current trend. If a juror does sub write down a question, I mean, I have the, we have the forms where they can do it, I will then pass it on to the parties, and then we can talk about it, and they can include the answer in their presentation. But I do not say to jurors, please feel free to submit a question whenever you, the will so strikes you. So I had also been trained in the U.S. Attorney's Office not to ask questions, but I did try it actually a lot as a Superior Court judge and found that it took a lot of time and that it totally blew up my trial length estimate because we had to take so many breaks <laughs> to discuss how to respond to the question. And then in the vast majority of cases, we couldn't actually answer the question. So it was very unsatisfying for the mm -hmm. jury because they took all this time and didn't really give us a meaningful answer. So... Um, that happened enough times that I just thought the benefit we were getting was just not outweighing all the time sink. Okay, so let me ask you about, we heard a little bit about Alice and Section 101 earlier today. Can we revisit that from the perspective of what's happening in the Northern District? I think Judge Seaborg, you told us you had five uh, of those, but maybe Judge Coe and Judge Ilston, you'd share your views on, on what you're seeing. I've had eight, <laughs> just counted them. Um, there, there were, it's, it feels to me anyway like there was a flurry at the beginning and there is a little bit less of a flurry uh, now as people have, have kind of settled into it. Um, and uh, uh, with one exception, I have, have only, only dis I've, I've once, I think, decided it on a, on a, either a 12B or a 12C motion. Um, but I, I think the better practice is to, to, in most cases, to wait until claim construction because there could be issues that arise in claim construction that are going to affect your analysis. Uh, so then uh, the most meaningful of those motions have arisen on summary judgment after claim construction. Judge Coe, what about you? 
So I've had a lot that were briefed, but the parties always settled and dismissed uh, before a ruling. So I've only issued one in two cases, um, and it was a motion to dismiss. So my experience may be just because, you know, if you get one case, then you have to relate all of the ones that are related. And so I've just had a slew of um, serial filed cases. And so they tend not to want to go all the way to ruling on those motions. Can, I, can I actually yes. add one thing? And not again to put my good friend, Chief Judge Stark, on the, on the uh, hot seat here, but he was nice enough to invite me to come to the District of Delaware's conference last year. And several lawyers in Delaware came up to me and said, uh, when they did, figured out the district I came from, said, oh, that's the patent killing district. And I said, well, uh, I didn't know we were known for that, um, but I can assure all of you that we have not had a meeting uh, of the judges of our court and said, let's, you know, uh, let's pound the bejesus out of these uh, critters. We don't, we don't do that. We haven't discussed any sort of unified approach to this. And, and as speakers earlier, uh, I'll, I'll read orders from judges around the country that have wrestled with 101 issues and uh, I don't think, I, I, I would be surprised if you did an analysis, and maybe some of you have done it, of our district. I, I wouldn't think we would be out of sync with other districts on that issue, but I don't know. Well, we hear from the Federal Circuit judges later, so I guess we'll, maybe <laughs> we can ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me ask you one more, which is, let's talk for a minute about how you, your experiences with Daubert motions in the context of patent cases, whether it's on the technology side, whether it's on the damages side, have those been a helpful tool to you? What observations do you have for the lawyers in the audience about how they might best make use of those? Can I start with you, Judge Coe? Is that? Well, um, I mean, the Daubert motions can be very helpful. Um, there are sometimes some ironic um, results. Uh, for example, I had one case where despite multiple Daubert motions being granted, uh, every time the expert came out with the same number but a different theory supporting <laughs> the same number. So um, query <laughs> what the, uh, you know, we're going to get the same number despite going through different theories and having different Daubert motions. So all I can say is that district judges, we are trying to play our gatekeeper function well, um, but uh, it's difficult. What I tell people is, um, and, and in, in patent cases, the Daubert motions tend to be um, at the damages end as opposed to the liability end. Um, in other cases, that's not, that's not always the case, but that's been my experience anyway in the patent side. And I just tell people it, it's really important that if you think you have a, well, it's important that the parties exchange damage theories and damage information reasonably early in the process because that can be tricky. Sometimes it's not so hard, but sometimes it can be tricky. And if you're going to make a Daubert motion that you think has some real merit to it on the damage side, if you do that three weeks before trial, it's too late. It puts everybody in an impossible position. Uh, it's going to be that much more difficult to persuade the court to toss the only expert that this party has uh, for trial purposes at that late date. So I just tell people if you have, if you think you have a, a, a real Daubert motion, file it early, so that either, so that it can be ruled on, and then the uh, the alternatives. And maybe, as Lucy says, you're just going to get the same number but with a different. Uh, a different algorithm, well, so be it. But at least do it early enough that, that the judge doesn't feel like granting the motion would leave a party with, with no witness at all because that, that's going to make it harder for you to win your Daubert motion. Um, the other thing I would say is I think there are entirely too many Daubert motions. Judge Seaborg? Well, I don't have much to add. I, I have found, in my experience, similar to Judge Ilston, that it's my primary experience has been in the damages area in the patent cases with Daubert motions. Um, I mean, they're critical. They, they've, uh, they've essentially been the big ticket of, the, of two or three of the cases that I've had where it's, it's been the big event. Um, I don't think there's anything, anything special about how to present it in terms of if you've got a Daubert motion, you should do it this way or that way. I, 
uh, I think you treat it as any other very significant motion. I think the timing issue that Judge Ilston mentions, um, I agree with her entirely on that score. So some courts uh, al almost always bifurcate liability and damages. Other courts almost never seem to bifurcate liability and damages. What do you, what's your practice? What do you see as the pros and cons of when you would do that and not? You want to start, Judge Olson? Um, I, my, my default is not to. Um, so unless there's a really good reason to do it, I, I don't do that. Um, because generally it just seems to me that the issues the issues on infringement and the issues on damages so frequently are going to have um, either an overlap or at least a, a concurrence uh, that it'll it'll be better for the, the the jury can do it all at one go. So uh, I I have not typically done that. Judge Coe? same for me. Yeah, and Judge Seaborg. Oh yeah, I think is it will come as no news to this group. If uh, if you're arguing for bifurcation, you have to remember that you're telling this particular judge you may have to do something twice when you could only have to do it once. <laughs> so you better have a very good reason why uh, it's gonna make sense. And I have the same uh, reaction my colleagues do. Great, so anything, any other advice, tips you would like to give to the lawyers in attendance today or any final remarks with regard to Judge White? Uh, uh, that you would like to share today? The lawyers may want to all go settle their cases now that they know that Judge White is officially going to be <laughs> retired from our court. I was just going to share some of the patent pilot statistics, great. if that's that okay. Um, so even though the Northern District of California may have fewer patent cases, we, are, as a percentage, our patent cases tend to go to Markman more often. Uh, tend to go to summary, ju summary judgment more often as a percentage and also to go on appeal. So I'll give some statistics here. And these are basically from when each district joined the patent pilot program, which for virtually every district was September 19 of 2011. Our district started about four months later in January of 2012. But here are some examples. So for the districts that have at least uh, a case with one ap cases with one appeal, um, the Central District, let me give you total pay, patent case filings and then cases with appeal. So the Central District of California, 1,592, 113 cases on appeal. The Northern District, 794, but we have 74 pay, uh, cases on appeal. The Eastern District of Texas, 6,201, but they have 80 cases on appeal. So for the Northern District, we have six less cases on appeal, even though we have less than a sixth of the cases of the Eastern District of Texas. So, um, you know, what I can say is we have fewer cases, but they tend to go to Markman, summary judgment, and appeal at a higher percentage and at a higher rate um, than other cases. And if you look at the three districts of California, Central, Northern, and Southern, even though um, we're a, a smaller percentage of the filings were over about 50% of all the appeals relative to the other 10 pilot districts. Now, the District of Delaware is not in the pilot, so that's missing you know, a very significant player in a large number of patent cases. Um, but it's just interesting to see how the different cases are being uh, litigated effectively in different districts. And in terms of what you know, we're, earlier the panel was saying, remember that patent cases are just a small percentage of what we do. I wanted to give some reflections on that. So for the Northern District, our patent cases are four to six percent of our civil docket. So it's actually quite small. We, we do a lot of other things. In the Eastern District of Texas in 2015, patent cases were 42 percent of their entire civil docket. So in the Central District, it's gone from five to nine percent in the last however many years, Southern District of California is two to four percent, Northern District of Illinois three to six percent, Southern District of New York two to four percent. Um, and what was interesting is if you look at the percentage of uh, cases that are serially filed in this district and in other, so in Eastern District of Texas it's 86 percent, Western District of Tennessee it's 55 percent, Northern District of Texas it's 41 percent, Northern District of Illinois it's 39 percent, Southern District of California it's 51 percent. Central District of California, it's 41%. Um, and these, other than 
um, Texas, which has gone up since the numbers that were accruing through August of 2014, everyone else, the numbers have actually gone down. So these high numbers that I'm, high percentages relatively, uh, that I'm reading off are actually slightly reduced from the numbers that accumulated through August of 2014. Um, so, you know, I will say that continuing the Giants versus the Dodgers competition that Judge Guilford mentioned, of these numbers, the Central District of California is 13% of the filings of all the patent cases in the, in the pilot districts, but 25% of the appeals. And in that category, we are happy to lose. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, there's some interesting statistics uh, that have been accumulated by the federal So the dockets, there. I mean, one thing that yeah. I take a quick takeaway from that is the dockets yes. in the different districts are very different in terms of the nature of the cases, the numbers that go through Markman, the numbers that go to trial, the numbers that presumably settle or, or are dismissed. It's very, very different. So if you have a Markman hearing, then the percentage that your case will terminate by way of a judgment versus a dismissal, which we all kind of assume is a settlement, is much, you know, it's much higher. If you have a Markman, you're more likely to have to go through judgment. If you don't have a Markman, then you're much likely to settle. Um, and so it's, it, it's just been very interesting to see these statistics. Um, and they've been largely, in some ways, consistent. I think the 2014 report also showed that in our district, as a percentage, you're much more likely to go to Markman and summary judgment and go to judgment as a percentage and, and appeal. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, and I guess it was true, although maybe your current trends are a little different, that you really have a very high percentage of significant competitor cases where the issues are not likely to be easily resolved just between the parties. Fair? I'll let my colleagues comment on that. All right. All right. I don't know. Okay. Judge Seaborg, any final comments from you? On I suppose my final comment would be, uh, as my colleagues on prior panels, and we may have commented on it, we, when we look at district court opinions uh, throughout the country, uh, they have persuasive value. We uh, study them, scrutinize them. But if you can find a Ronald White case, definitely cite that to us. <laughs> Well, with that, please join me in thanking our three panelists very much.